Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. Our scripture will come from Revelation 11 and 17. Revelation 11 and 17. And it reads, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. That's Revelation 11 and 17. It says, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty. You are who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and began, begun to reign. And our song is Awesome God because we know that God is an awesome God. And he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Eternal God in heaven, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being just the awesome God. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you do. God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us, for we realize that you reign. And Lord, Father God, there's none like you. We thank you, Father God, for being who you are. Now, Lord, we come to you, Father God, realizing that we've fallen short. Lord, we messed up. We have done those things that are not pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father God, that you forgive us for our sins. We ask you to bless us on tonight, Father God, that we will be about your business, that we, Father God, will do those things that are pleasing, that we will study your word, that your word will be clear, your word will be relevant, and your word, Father God, will be accurate. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yes, we serve the awesome God. Amen. 
We're in Proverbs chapter 3, chapter 3 of Proverbs. Last week we studied, we studied verses 1 through 6. Tonight we're looking at verses 7 through 10. Last week we dealt with verses 1 through 6 and we discovered that the wise writer was talking to his son. And as the wise writer spoke with his son, he reminded his son of God's precepts. He said, remember the law. Whatever you do, remember the law. He said, do not forget the law. Do not forget God's will. Do not forget God's way. He says, remember the law, remember his precepts. This law that he's talking about is the law of Moses, and they are found in the first five books of the Bible. It is called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is found in the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. So the, the writer says to his son, remember the law. Keep the law and keep the Lord's commandments. And he says, take those commandments and put them in your heart. Place them in the innermost being of your body. Place them in the innermost being where you reason. Place these precepts, these statutes, this law of Moses, this law of God, place them in your heart. Put them in your heart. He says, place them, continue to keep the law of God, the laws of God, the commandments or the commands of God, keep them in your heart. He goes on to say in verse number two, if you keep them in your heart, if you put these precepts, these laws in your mind, in your heart, if you keep them in your heart, he says in verse number two, that there will be some additions. The first one is the length of days. It, sa it says that we will have long days. If you keep these precepts in your heart, if you keep this law of Moses, if you keep this law of God, you will have long days. If you do not keep them, you will have short days. Have you seen young people do foolish things and it shorten their days? <laughs> Exodus and the first 10 commandments, the first commandment without, the first commandment with, with promise is the one that if you honor your mother and your father, you will have long days. Some people say, I know I'm gonna live a long time because I respect my parents growing up. It says these, if you keep these laws, if you keep these precepts, these statutes, if you keep the commandments of God, you will have long days. And he also says you will have long life. If you have long days, that means that is a there's a length of days. You will have long days. But when it talks about long life, he's talking about the whole time. The whole time of your life. The other promise he makes or additions he gives is the fact that you will have peace. Keep these laws, keep these commandments, keep these precepts, keep these ordinances, keep these statutes, and you will have long days, long life, and peace. Peace means you will have safety. You will have prosperity. You will have welfare. You have peace. I asked last week, how many people in the room want some drama? Not one person raised their hand. And I asked the question last week, Sister Jones, I asked this question last week, is that who sings the song, No More Drunk? Almost every Christian in the room knew who sung the song. No more drama in my life, no more drama. So we will have peace. If we keep the commandments of God, we will have peace, safety, prosperity, welfare won't have drama. Yeah, I'm so glad that people don't want drama. I am so happy that people don't want drama. I told you last week there was one particular preacher that's going on to be with the Lord. 
He pastored the church and he said that if nothing is going on, he'll start something. What he was saying is if the members were not in an uproar, he would get them in an uproar. He would put them against each other. Well, that's not the case at the New Beginning Church. I don't want any more drama. I had enough drama. I don't want people after each other. I don't want people cussing each other. I don't want people fighting over food. I, I just want peace, safety, prosperity, rest. Then he says, he says, maintain mercy. Whatever you do, maintain mercy. Verse number three, he says to maintain mercy. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Maintain mercy. Mercy, goodness, kindness, pity, and love. God pities us when we mess up. God offers his love to us. God gives us goodness and kindness. He gives us mercy. Someone said on last week that mercy is when you don't receive that which is bad that you deserve to receive. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how good you've been, God has given you mercy. He's given you one more chance. God has given you mercy. I thank God for mercy. We don't deserve it, but God just keeps giving it to us because he is a merciful God. So maintain mercy. Then he says, maintain truth. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Maintain it, continue to hold on to it. This word truth means stability, be stable. There are some unstable people in this world. And sometimes I just ask the question, have you taken your medication today? Because I know you on some. Truth, stability, trustworthiness, and veracity. This word comes from veracity. The word veracity means truth. It's a legal term. It's a legal term, meaning that the, whatever the witness say, the witness has veracity. In other words, they don't, they, they maintain their accountability. You can trust what they say. Truth, veracity. We can trust what God has said. Even in a courtroom, we can trust if God says it. Whatever the judge says goes, right? Except in the great United States of America. Whatever the judge says ought to go. Thank God that the judge that we have, the ultimate judge, God himself, thank God that he is not a judge like these wimpy judges we have. He keeps his word. And whatever the God, our judge says, that God, he keeps his word. He, he carries truth. He's stable. He, he's trustworthy. He has veracity. He is trustworthy. He goes on to say in, in verse number three, he says, bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. The word bind means to gird them, to knit them, to confine them and to tie them around your neck. You, you need this word of God tied around your neck. In Deuteronomy chapter six, the Bible says that to, to those of us who have children, whatever you do, write it on the tables of their hearts, write it on their foreheads, write it on the doorpost. Make sure they quote it going in, make sure they quote it going out. This word of God is so important until we need to, we need to bind it, gird it on the tablets of our hearts. It says, girded or binded around their neck. The word neck means their throat. Means their very deep thoughts. The stuff that comes out of their mouths ought to be from the word of God. Their throat ought to breathe out the word of God. They ought to speak the word of God. The word is rumination. Rumination means that you chew it up like a cow chewing a coo. This word is so important that we put it around our necks, it ends up in our throats, and when, when it ends up in our throat, we ought to make sure that we chew on it and, and drop it down and chew on it some more. When you, when you examine a cow, 
in the country. This cow has a cud. What's a cud? A cud is, is whatever he chooses. It's usually hay that he chews on all day long. And it's a big old thing that he puts in his mouth. He chews on it all day long. And the reason why he can chew on it all day, all day long is because he have an inner stomach and an outer belly. And what he does is he chews on it and he drops it down in his inner stomach. And he brings it back up. And he chews on it some more. And he drops it down in his outer belly. And he brings it back up and he chews on it some more. Some 20 some hours, he chews on the same cook. What the, the, the writer is saying to us today is that we have to chew on the word constantly. We ought to act like we got an inner stomach and an outer belly. We ought to chew on it and then bring it up and chew on it some more. In other words, meditate on the word of God. Meditate on it, chew on it like a cow chewing on a cut. Verse three of uh, Proverbs three says, write it. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them on your, your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. It has to be on your heart. When people walk around and do anything, say anything, and act any kind of way, you can count on the fact that they don't have the word in their heart. Because when the word is in your heart, you, you feel some guilt sometimes. When the word is in your heart and you know you're doing wrong, you will stop from doing wrong. When the word is in your heart, after you've done wrong, you will confess that you've done wrong. So it needs to be in your heart. Write it, word write means to inscribe it, to record it and to engrave it. Write it on the words of your heart, on the tablets of your heart, the slabs of your heart, the boards, the tables of your heart. Write it on the tables of your heart. The word heart means your intelligence, your intellect, your understanding, your innermost being. You ought to put it deep down within you. This word, the psalmist says it like this. I want the word of God on my heart that I will not sin against you. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight that I won't sin against God. The word keeps us from sinning. We need to know the word. That's why we're listening to the word. That's why we're studying the word. That's why we go to Bible study. That's why we go to Sunday school. That's why we participate in the teaching arms of the church. It's because our hearts are our intelligence and our intellect. We need it on our heart. Verse four, it says, if you do these things and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. When you make sure that the word of God is priority, you will find favor with God and you will find favor with man. Some people say, well, if I find favor with God, why I need favor with man? Because God blesses us through mankind. God keeps us. And God allows people to come past us to bless us. Anybody can identify with favor? Anybody had any favor here lately? Have you had any mercy, something you received that you, something bad that you should have received that you didn't receive? Or have you had favor or grace when you received that which is good and you didn't deserve it? It's good to have favor with God. I'm telling you, favor, Brother Miles, is better than money. I didn't say you don't need money. Because I think all of us in the room, anybody in this room need a little money, just some? How many people need a lot of money? A lot of money. When I pray, I'm asking God for a whole heap and a plenty. But it's better to have favor with God and favor with man than it is to have money. And I'm asking God, give me both of them in. Because if I have favor with God and favor with man, and I have some money, guess what? God can bless it all. Oftentimes say, I don't see how athletes go broke. 
I don't see how entertainers go broke. I just don't understand it. Maybe because I never had it, that's why I don't understand it. But if I get 25, 26 million dollars, I have that plus some when Jesus get back. I guarantee you. And I don't need an uncle or cousin to tell me what to do with it. I think I can do more with what God blessed me with than anybody else can. Because you know, mathematics is pretty simple, right? If you add, if you subtract, you will get different numbers. If you multiply, if you divide, you're gonna get different numbers. I don't have to figure that, I don't have to be a financial genius to figure out. If I spend more than I put in the bucket, the bucket gonna get empty. Do we know that? If you don't keep putting something in the bucket and you keep pulling something out of the bucket, the bucket is gonna get empty. God gives us favor. And, and as we go through this, this text, we're going to find out not only do we need favor with God and man, not only do we need money, we need God to give us wisdom in how to handle it. He says, he says in verse number three, he says, he says, uh, write them on the table of your heart. These precepts, these godly things are so important to us. We wake up in the morning, we do other stuff before we get along with the Lord. How bad, better would your day be if you spent time with the Lord first? Just spend time with him and just, just some other word. Get your day kicked off with him. And how much better would we sleep at night if we end the night with God? No melatonin, just God. No, no fruit of the vine, just God. Just God, just God. So, so the Bible teaches that we ought to write it on the tables of our hearts, our understanding. Verse number four, we're going to find favor with God and man. Verse number five, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust him. Trust, have security in the Lord. Our security ought to be in the Lord himself. Our security ought to reside in God. Have security in the Lord. Security ought to be in the Lord. Trust him. Have confidence in him. Hope in him. This word hope doesn't mean that you hope something happened. This means that even when there is no hope, we're going to hope in God against hope. We got to learn to hope against hope. We, we have to learn when there is no way that we believe God will provide a way. Hope against hope. If you can't see it, have faith in it. Trust in the Lord. It says trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, trust him. This Lord is Jehovah. This Lord is the self-existing true God, the self-existing God, the true God himself. Trust him. The other day, ladies said, well, you know, I'm a Jehovah's witness. I say, I am too. I witness for Jehovah just like you do. We just got a different message. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I can't get involved in what you're involved in. Well, you know, I can't sit up and have a Bible study with you either. But I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I'm witnessing for Jehovah God himself, the self-existing God. When you see in the Bible, you see the, the word Lord is in all caps. That identifies God as the self-existing God. That identifies God as Jehovah God. This is the official God, the official title for God. It is the Jewish name for God. He's the accept existing God. It says, put your trust in this Lord, the Lord God himself. Trust him. Have your security in him. With all your heart, all your innermost being, trust in this God. He goes on to say, lean not to your own understanding. 
Don't depend on your own understanding. You can't depend on yourself. Don't, don't depend on your own, don't depend on your own discernment. I discern that this is gonna happen. Don't depend on your discernment. You have to trust in God. Don't depend on your own knowledge. Don't depend on your own wisdom. Your trust has to be in God and God alone. Lean not to your own understanding, depend on this God that we talk about, this God that we serve. And we closed out with verse number six. In verse number six, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In all your ways, admit, acknowledge that God is God. The Hebrew writer says, he that believe must believe that God is, meaning that God exists. Before you can have faith in God, you gotta first believe God exists. You gotta believe that God is real. You have to believe that we serve a real living God that we don't see but he's orchestrating what goes on around us. We don't see him. We have to tell our children, in order for God to orchestrate everything, God has to turn his back on everything else. When you look at an orchestra, the director of the orchestra has this little bitty small pencil pen or a wand. But if he's going to direct the orchestra, he has to turn his back on the audience. We have to tell children, if you're going to be the, in direction of your path, if you're going to be the one who controls your will and your way, you got to turn your back on peer pressure. You got to walk away from other folks. If you're going to direct the orchestra, you got to turn your back on the crowd. God, God directs our path. This word direct means that he makes it straight. He directs our path. This word direct means that he, he uprights our path. Have your life ever been upside down? Somebody may have an upside down life right now. God right sides our, up our path. He, he right side up. He, he puts the right side. He writes up our path. This word path means our road, our rank and our rank. The Bible says that if you're gonna be blessed of the Lord, if you're gonna get a promotion, you gotta understand that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from God in heaven. If you're gonna receive a valid promotion, a promotion to a job that you can keep, a promotion to a career that you can hang on to, you gotta trust in God so much so that you trust that God and God alone will give you your promotion. Because some of us, many of us in this room have, have gotten pink slips or dismissal slips. And we thought we were headed down a slippery slope, but that, that dismissal slip was really a blessing for the next thing that God had to come. You gotta get rid of some stuff. You gotta move the zeros over in order to be a hero. Gotta get rid of some stuff. Steve Harvey tells a story that every day he came home, he would tell his mama, mama, I'm gonna get me a new car. She said, yeah, but your old car is sitting out there on blocks. Come home the next day, mama, I'm gonna get a new car. Yeah, but your old car is sitting in the driveway on blocks. Come home the next day, mama, I'm gonna get me a new car. He said, she said, yeah, but your old car is sitting in the driveway outside on blocks. So he finally got it. He said, you know, my mama was a school, was, was a Sunday school teacher and she didn't always make things plain. She wanted you to figure it out. So he went out there and took that car off the blocks and, and sold it off a strap and moved the blocks out of the way and, and took all the oil stains off the driveway. And in a few days he had a brand new car. You have to get rid of junk stuff in order to have new stuff. Somebody need to get rid of junk stuff, a junk person to get rid of, mm, to get, get somebody else. 
You got zeros in the way. Now, if you're married, hang in there. Make that zero a hero. But don't go choose your zero. <laughs> Tonight, we are at um, Proverbs 7 through 10. And it leads up to the fact that he says, in all your ways acknowledge him, he will direct your path. And verse seven says, do not be wise in your own eyes. He's already said, don't lean to your own understanding. You can't trust yourself. Now he's saying to us, don't be wise in your own eyes. You ever seen people that really think they got it going on? And everybody know they slide down a slippery slope but them. But they have come to the conclusion, boy, I really got it going on. I, I really, I'm on top of the world. And they wake up one morning and the world is on top of them. It says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It says to us, verse number seven, do not be wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise. Don't be skilled till no one can tell you anything. Don't, don't be so, so intelligent till you can't hear from other people. And you can't hear from God. Word wise means skilled or intelligent. We have some intelligent folk in this world. I mean, they are tremendously intelligent. Some of them are so intelligent, they don't know when to shut up. Here I am, I'm sitting in front of the judge and, and I know this judge has my future and my money in his, in, his high, in his hand. Not only will I not shut up, my associates won't shut up. Got my whole future. My whole future is in his hand. But I cut him down, I talk bad about him, I talk bad to him. I tell, him, tell the world he doesn't know what he's doing, but my whole future is in his hand. Let me tell you, your whole future is in God's hand. Don't be so skilled and intelligent until you come to the conclusion that you are wise enough to handle these things. He goes on to say, do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear God and depart from evil. Fear, this word fear means to reverence or revere God. Revere God, respect God, honor God. Stand at awe of God. God ought to amaze us every day. Does he amaze you every day? God ought to amaze us every minute of the day. Some of us go to sleep at night and just take it for granted. We're going to get up in the morning. And people sleep away from here every single day. People slip away every day. The old and the young, they just slip away because the God we serve can speak or think and dead folk have to get up. He can speak or think and live people have to lay down and die. God doesn't have to blink an eye. He doesn't have to say anything. He can just think it. And the only reason I say think it is because that's what we can relate to. When John, John, John in Revelation talks about how heaven looks, he uses phrases that we can identify with. But heaven is much greater than what John can describe. But we can only identify with jasper walls, pearly gates, golden streets. But when we get to heaven, we're going to see something much more than that. There are people who say they died and came back to life and they saw a bright light that, that they had never imagined, never seen before. Heaven is better than that. John just said, i tell you what, I'm going to tell you what happened. John says, I saw a group of people, 144,000 from the, from the tribes of Israel. And then he said, and I looked at another one number, I got up to 2 million trillions and I couldn't count anymore. He said, I see a number that no man can number. So John tells us that he's limited. He tells us that mankind is limited, but heaven is gonna be much better than that. 
It's pretty amazing. We ought to be at awe with who God is. We ought to be, be so at awe until we understand it's a privilege just for God to recognize us. The psalmist in Psalm 8 says, oh, what is man that God is mindful of him? He starts off by saying, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What is man that man that God is mindful of man? Then he closes it out by saying, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The God we serve, we ought to be in awe of him. We ought to be amazed with him. Don't be wise in our own mindset. We ought to be amazed with God. We ought to be blown away with God. We ought to be at a point where when God shows us something, we got to just believe it and move forward. When God shuts some things down, we ought to just go with what God has shut down. Because God, we, the God we serve, he has the ability to shut doors that no man can open. He has the ability to open doors that no man can close. If you look on these, these two metal doors and the metal doors throughout the building, we have what is called the ultimate lock. The ultimate lock was built by Mr. Daniels. And Daniel says, and he shows a video, Mr. Daniels shows the video of how police officer took a batter ram and tried to push the door open with it. Bam, bam, and the door wouldn't come open. Mr. Daniel said that, the, that, the, that the, the door would break, a metal door would break before the lock give up. We got a bunch of them. Got some at the house, some at the church. I mean, we got the ultimate lock. But this is the problem. Sometimes the lock doesn't break, but the little bitty pin that turns the lock has broken twice on us. It's called the ultimate lock. It, it costs a lot of money. It is the ultimate lock. The demonstration is good, but the key, you can put it in there and the key will turn, but the pin on the inside has broken. Only God has the ultimate lock. Only God is the one who can shut a door that no man can open. Only God, and check this out, after I couldn't get my key in, the, I could get the key in, but couldn't unlock the door. I had to call the manufacturer to come out there and take the lock apart and pull a little bitty flat pin out and put the pin back together and put the lock back on. And guess what, Sister Barney? That costs more money. The God we serve can shut doors and it won't cost us any money. The God we serve can open doors and it won't cost us any money. We ought to just be at all with God. So you tell me, what about God push you at all? What blows your mind about God? What is it that God has shown you that just flat trips you out? Anybody? Anybody? Does God trip you out every now and then? Does God put you at all with him? Is there anything that God has shown you that you'll be like, wow, look at God? Anybody? Nobody? Everybody say, mm-hmm. Anybody has an example? Maybe, maybe I should ask the question properly. You have an example of what, what you've seen God do? Something that God has done that you know God did it? brought me through cancer. How you know, I thought Dr. Darkcourt did that. You think it was God? Okay, I had to tell Dr. Darkcourt to get us that money back then. I mean, millions. See, I found out that one cancer treatment costs $50,000. $50,000 for one cancer treatment. And I'm sure uh, three, four years later, it's way more than that. One cancer treatment, and then they make sure you got you got to have 20. Now, don't miss it. You do the first 12, then you do the final eight. You got to have 20. $50,000, Sister Irvin, for one four-hour treatment. And then after you get that treatment, 
Then you got to go get, get the radiation. Then, well, let's make sure we get so we do some cutting. Then we got a pill that's, that's a whole lot of money, one pill. You take this pill for a couple of weeks. You can take all the pills. You can get all the chemo. You get all the radiation. You get all the surgeries. If God doesn't say so, it is ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and earth to earth, period. God has to say so. I am so at all with God. Y'all do know I didn't suppose to live past 17, 18. I'm almost 51 now. Almost 61. I'm almost 61 now. Look at God. Nobody, as, as Jones said, I'm almost 51. What are you talking about? I know he's older than I am. She was like, what's his problem? He was 51 when he came here. <laughs> so if we do not find ourselves at all with God, we are missing God. Just, just your physical body, just your physique, just your breathing. Some people go to sleep and they, they stop breathing. And they, they, they can't wake up on their own. Some people are walking along and their heart just stop beating. Some people are jumping and running and turning cockwheels and all of a sudden they drop dead. I am at awe with God, setting still, what God is able to do. But the greatest miracle that one will ever witness is the saving of a lost soul. I'm at all with God. God saved us. Look at your life. Don't, don't even think about the things you did wrong, but just look at the fact that you're on planet Earth with all hell breaking loose, and all of a sudden you end up in heaven when you leave here. I'm telling you, we got the best deal. <laughs> I'm at all with God. We have the best deal. We have the best deal. There's a guy named Money that used to be on Let's Make a Deal, Money, Monty Hall, Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. We already got the best deal. I am just amazed at awe with God. He says, fear the Lord, be at awe with him. Verse number seven, fear him, be at awe with him, so much so until you depart from evil. Depart, be removed from evil. Turn aside from evil. You have to voluntarily turn aside. And let me tell you, you can't negotiate with evil. How many people try to negotiate with you? You know, I'm going to stop when I do this. I remember young, one, one young man years ago in the 80s, I think. Uh, he was known as a drug dealer, but he was trying to get his life together to come to church. And when he came to church, I saw him, his beeper went off at church. All y'all were living when beeper was out with him, right? His beeper went off. He looked at the beeper real quickly, put it back on his side, looked at me, and I approached him. I said, well, man, when are you going to stop doing what you're doing? He said, man, what you talking about? Okay, man, come on, we, we, we here now, come on, let's deal with this. I said, when are you going to stop doing what you're doing? And he said to me, man, I got $25,000 worth left. When I get through with this $25,000 worth, I am done. I said, well, why don't you just flush it down the toilet? He said, man, you must be a fool. <laughs> I just told you it was $25,000 and you want me to flush it down the toilet? But I promise you, when I finish this last drop, I'm done. That guy finished that last drop and he was done. To this day, he had picked it up again. He's a minister now and he's, he's recruiting people for Christ. It did not have to end that way though. He could have made the last drop and never been his last 
breath. I'm in awe with God, how God has taken this young man from being a great, if there's such a word, drug dealer to being in church. Is it, is this, does, does that attitude go with that now? That, that attitude, that, okay, a strong drug, that doesn't go with it either. A, a vicious dope dealer, y'all like that one better. He's gone from being a horrible dope dealer, a filthy rich dope dealer, to a preacher. And he ain't making the money now, Brother Miles, that he used to make. But he has not been looking over his shoulder since. I'm at all with what God has done. I am amazed with what God has done. So we have to fear God, reverence him, respect him, be amazed with him, depart from evil. And you just can't sit and say, evil, I'm going to leave you alone. You just got to leave it alone. You just got to stop it. Late Pastor E.V. Hill said somebody asked him the question, how do I get out of sin? He said, stop it! How do I walk away from sin? Stop it! You just have to walk away. You don't look back. You, you just give it up and you quit it. And you leave it alone. Verse number seven declares that we have to depart from sin. Fear the Lord, depart from sin. Verse number eight, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. It will be health to your flesh. Flesh, this word means navel, it means the umbilical cord. It is the umbilical cord that gives us our center of strength. If you just walk away from evil, turn aside from it, fear the Lord, depart from evil, then this action will be health to your flesh. Leave it alone, just quit it. Just stop it. Cold turkey, bam, just stop. He says, he says for us to depart from evil, just leave it alone. The wise writer says, flee. Flee doesn't mean you just slowly drag away now. Flee means you get out of here. You run in a hurry, you get in a hurry. You flee, depart from evil, and it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bone. It will be strength to your bone. It means that it will be life to us. It will be moisture to our bones. Our bones need moisture, right? The reason why some of us of age can't afford to break anything is because it takes so long to mend. Because we lack the moisture we used to have. I was going up the steps all this week and every step I took, I heard. And I thought I was in good shape, but my knees were telling me something ain't right. In other words, I need to take some medication or some pills. I need to take some liquid, something that will put moisture in my bones. So they won't be sounding off. But the word of God is, it is health to our flesh. The word of God is, is strength to our bones. The word bones means that it is strength to your moral, your moral, your moral, and strength to your exterior. It is strength to your bone, meaning that it is strength, it is moisture to your interior, your moral, and it is strength to your exterior. I don't know what the, the, the medication they say, you take these and then you won't, if you fall, you won't have to worry about being broken. But let me tell you, if the Lord doesn't keep you, I don't care what medication you take. You, you, I don't, it doesn't matter what medication you take. Let me tell you something, that if the Lord doesn't keep moisture in our bones, then we are going to get to a point where they will crack easily. But the word of God supplies moisture, it supplies life to our interior and exterior, the inside and the outside. Verse number nine. 
Honor the Lord with your possessions. Uh-oh. It's in my Bible. Is it in yours? Honor the Lord with your possessions. Honor the Lord with your possession means your substance, your wealth, your riches. Honor the Lord with your substance, with your wealth, with your riches. Honor the Lord. Bring your possessions to him. And then it says, look at what it says, and with the first fruits, honor the Lord with the first fruit of your increase. The first fruit, the beginning. First fruit means beginning. First fruit means chief. First fruit means the important things. First fruit means the principal things. Honor the Lord with your first fruit. What, were, what was Adam and Eve's two sons' name? First two sons. Adam and Eve had two sons. What were their names? Cain and Abel. Which one we label as a good son? Which one we label as a bad son? Abel is good. Cain was bad. Is he good because he's dead? You know, that's what we do in the 21st century, right? Everybody that lays across here is dead now. And everybody that lays across here is good. Why was, what was the difference between Cain and Abel when it came to God? Hmm? I can't hear you. His offering, his offering, okay? His possessions, his stuff, his substance. What was the difference in their offerings? What was the difference? Tell me about Abel offering. What, what's about Abel offering? God recognized Abel's offering as a good offering, right? He brought the first fruit. He brought the first principle. He brought the first chief. It brought the first benefit. Whatever he got, he brought it first to God. He brought it right away. What happened to Cain? He brought it over a period of time. He had to sleep on it. He had to pray about it. He had to ask somebody about it. He had to Facebook it, internet it. He had to check into it to see if God would do what God says he would do. And because Abel was accepted by God, his offering was accepted by God, Cain got upset. This word, first fruit, means bring God your very best and bring it right away. The other thing about this word first fruit, it means bring it the first time. It ought to be the first in time and it ought to be the first time. I mean, bring it off the top. Bring your wealth off the top. Bring your fruit off the top. Don't negotiate it. Matter of fact, don't forget to put it on top of your budget, not in your budget. Don't forget to bring God his first. So this word means first time. The word first fruit means first time. It means first place. It means first in order and first in rank. The very best. Bring it first in time. Bring it first time and first in time. Bring it first place. Bring it first place. The words, the words put God in first place. It comes from the Brazilian, the, the Portuguese word God in first place means put God first. God in first place is interpreted put God first. Put God in first place, put God in first order, put God in first rank of all your increase. The word increase means your, your produce your income, your revenue, your gain, your increase, your produce, your income, your revenue, and your gain. Anything you gain, people ask the question, Pastor Davis, why do you give off of gift cards that people give you? Because gift cards are money and gift cards are gifts. And we ought to bring God the first off of gift cards, the first off of money, 
The first off of whatever we get. Questions or comments? Somebody got something to say right about that. Anybody? Okay. Portion from your tax return. Even though we have given first, first throughout the year, we ought to still bless the Lord. We ought to be able to bless the Lord because he put the right CPA or accountant in front of us to make sure we do get a return. Because if you go to the wrong account, guess what happened? They take your money, you don't get a return. And your accountant doesn't have to lie. Put God first place. Make him first in your heart. It says, give God the first fruit of all your increases. Is your overtime increase? Yes. What you work on your side job? Yes. What you get from, from, uh, from somebody else, somebody donated to you, first fruit, give it to God. Don't even negotiate it. Don't struggle with it. Just do it. Should I give off the gross or the net? What's the difference? What's the gross and the net? What's the difference? Who's talking? Sister Earth. Okay, your gross is what you make total, right? Whether it's bi-weekly or year, the net is what you bring home, right? So what you do is you give God the 10% or 20% or 25%, whatever God has functioned you to do, give it off your gross, not your net. Because we can manipulate our net. Some folk have their car note coming out of their gross. Some people have their house note coming out. Now here it is, God, I got $2 to bring you. Some people have automatic bill payment off of the, before their check hit the, hit the bank, they, they have all these things coming out. They have some guy called FICA that take your money. Some woman named Medicare and another named Medicaid that take your money. There's a social guy called security. He takes your money that they're trying to get rid of him now. They're trying to kill social security before we get there. But let me tell you, two years from now, they ain't got to worry about me waiting because they're trying to kill him. After they've taken my grandparents, my parents, and my money, they're trying to kill him before I get there. And so when you have all these things taken out, and then you're going to tell God, well, now, God, here it is. As if God hadn't blessed you with it all. God blesses us with, a, with a gift cards. Vouchers is money. People pay for stuff for us. That's money. We ought to bring it to the Lord. Out of all our increase, we ought to give it first to the Lord. I tell you, if you give more than 10% throughout the whole year, you won't have to struggle with it. Don't be stingy when it comes to God. It says give it from your increase, your produce, your income, your revenue, and your gain, including what other folk give you. Bring your first fruit to God. Verse number 10. So your bonds, check this out. Now he said, bring your first fruit to God. He says, whatever you do, make sure you give it to God. Trust God with it. He's continuing from all the way from verse number one, telling you to trust God. He says, keep God's commandments. Then he says, trust God, lean not to your own understanding. And then he says, bring your first fruit unto God. Bring even your increase unto him. And now he says in verse number 10, so your bonds will be filled with plenty. Look at the promise God makes. He says, so your bond will be filled, your bonds will be filled with plenty. Bonds, your storehouse, bonds, uh, that which keeps you together. So your bonds will be filled. So your bonds will be filled with plenty. The word plenty means abundance. I like to hear church folk talk about how, how God blessed me with blessings that I didn't have room enough to receive. 
He blesses me. Have you ever gotten a call? You didn't, you couldn't get a job for six months, and then you get one call, then you get two calls, then you get three calls. Now you got three interviews, you got to, and you pass all three interviews, and now you have to decide which job. It is in your hands. That's what I call running over, gifts of, from God running over, shaken down, pressed down, and shaken together. And when you run it over, look what, the, look what the wise writer says. He says that your bonds will be filled with plenty. And look at the last part. He says, and your vats will run over or overflow with new wine. Your vats. In those days, they, they had wine press. This word vat means press, a press, or troughs. And what they would do, they would press the, the grapes and there was a discharge line of what we would call a drain line. And that drain line will, will, will put the juices over into barns or, or vats or troughs. And the people will come by and they would dip out from the troughs. The Bible says, if you obey, obey these principles, your troughs will be filled and your troughs will be overrun your trials will overflow. You know why some people trials never overflow? Because they're too stingy when it comes to God and they're too stingy when it comes to people. The, the, the wise writer says, do these few things and your vats will run over. And whenever you see the Bible talks about wine, it's not always talking about drinking wine. It's talking about the joy. Your joy will run over. Your dreams will come to pass. You will have great joy. Oh, I'm excited about it. I'm excited that God is able to make our vats run over if we obey his commandments, if we trust in him, if we don't lean to our own understanding, if we make sure that we understand to bring his first fruit, then he will make sure that our joy runs over. And people will see you and say, boy, they ain't worried about anything. That's how broke people made it. <laughs> Their joy ran off. It's not in your money. You're trying to hold on to money. And guess what? If you don't bring it to God, the devil takes it. Well, how does he take it? I got to buy a starter for my car. I got a brand new tire that just went on a flat. Now I got my car won't start. And now I got to go to the doctor. And now the doctor says it's going to be $600. That's why I tell God up front, God, I'm going to give you 10. I'm going to give you 15. I'm going to give you 25%. I'm going to give it to you up now. I'm going to give it to you first so the devil won't take it from you. So my joy, my new wine will overflow. It will run over. Put the word of God on your heart. On a, write it on the tablets of your heart that your joy will run over. Jesus paid that price for us. He died on Calvary. He rose from the dead. And now we have joy. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try this joy. It's joy I have. The world didn't give it to me. And the world cannot take it away. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior. This is your moment. You ought to try him. Try Jesus. Trust the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a skull hill called Calvary. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. This little simple story and trust in this story can get you to heaven. This story can um, allow you to walk away from sin. Will you bow your head with me tonight and invite Jesus Christ into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, 
I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sure My Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. Please come and visit us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m for our Sunday school. Stay with us for 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. And please continue to join us for Bible study at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday night. Again, thank you for joining us. Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise report. We need to continue to pray for Sister Lillian Darrington. We're also praying for Sister Paul's son-in-law. His name is Patrick Brown, Patrick Brown. He really needs your prayers right now. We wanna lift him before the Lord. We wanna lift Patrick Brown before the Lord on tonight. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for your word. We ask you, Father God, to bless your word. Now, Lord, we come lifting up Patrick Brown. We pray that you heal and touch his body. We pray that you amaze the doctors and put them in awe. We pray, Father God, that you lift him up again, that he will be able to proclaim you as Lord. Bless us now. This is our prayer. We thank you, Father God, for this study. We ask you to bless us as we're going and bless us, Father God, as we go forth in your name. We pray for the choirs they come to sing unto you. We ask you to bless them, Father God, that they will be about your business. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 7759. Four, five, nine. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of our service. You are dismissed.